Welcome back. In this video, I'm going to touch on the concepts of market efficiency, and I'll show you a couple of market anomalies that tend to indicate that maybe markets are not as efficient as we would like them to be. So I'll start off by talking about what exactly market efficiency is and why it's important, and then I'll talk about the three classic forms of market efficiency, and then we'll review some market anomalies, talk about cumulative abnormal returns, and I'll wrap up by talking about how realistic market efficiency really is. Okay, to get us started, I have a theoretical question here. You know that the price per share of Google stock is going to be $900 in one week. Google's share price is currently $800. What do you do? Well, if you're me, you'd want to buy up as many shares of Google as you could all the way up until Google's share price is just shy of $900. So I might borrow a bunch of cash from, oh, let's say my broker or a bank or a friend, and use that to buy up shares of Google until the share price is just shy of $900. So why do we care about this? Why do we care about this theoretical exercise? Well, there are several definitions of market efficiency. One of the oldest definitions would be attributed to Louis Bachelier. Uh, so he said that past, present, and even discounted future events are reflected in market price, but often show no apparent relation to price changes. Put a little more succinctly, Eugene Fama, back in his dissertation, said a market in which prices always fully reflects all available information is called efficient. If we are taking into account all information that we have available, then in that previous example that I just gave you, Google's share price should very quickly move close to $900 because everyone should bid up the price of Google to close to $900 if they know that the price is going to be $900 in a week. Okay, so what is the efficient markets hypothesis? Well, hopefully you saw this in your earlier finance classes, but uh, we often call the efficient markets hypothesis this idea that as soon as information becomes available, a rational investor will trade on it, and that will make share prices and other asset prices reflect all available information. We have three forms of the efficient markets hypothesis. Uh, we'll start off with the weak form. So the weak form essentially says that stock prices reflect all information that can be obtained using past prices, trading volume, and short interest. Basically, any return data that's available, that should be priced in. Next, we have the semi-strong form of market efficiency. And this says that really any publicly available information uh, should be priced in. So information on, oh, let's say the price to book ratio or, oh, I don't know, the volume of cars that Ford sold last year, that should be priced into the value of Ford stock. The final form of market efficiency is the strong form. And it says that all public and private information is reflected in a, a firm stock price, or really the asset price. Uh, so in other words, if the CEO or say some worker on the line knows some information, they will bid up the price or bid down the price of the stock until it reflects all available private information. Uh, we'll see which of these forms is most realistic in the US, but here we go. Okay, so big question, are markets efficient? Well, I thought I'd show you the daily returns of the S&P 500 index over the last, oh, 30 years. And what you can get here is that returns do appear to be normally distributed. We don't see any big high returns way out here. We don't see any large numbers of very negative returns reflecting, oh, wow, this there was a big event that probably should have been known about. What this really reflects is that there is generally a, a constant stream of information being flooded into the market, and investors tend to respond to that. There's not like some big price changes very, very frequently. I mean, we don't see really fat tails here. So why should we care whether markets are efficient? Well, if markets are efficient, then we shouldn't be able to use new information to beat the market. The entirety or the entire return that you could earn is based on how much market risk you're willing to take on. If you're less risk averse and willing to take on more market risk, aka take on a higher beta for stocks, then you should be compensated 
by a higher return. Now, how can we test whether a market is efficient? Well, there are a couple of tests that we can perform. Uh, the most obvious one is this first one. So we can look at the performance of trades over time. The efficient market hypothesis essentially says that one trade should not consistently outperform or underperform. The only thing that should matter is the amount of market risk that you or a standard investor has taken on. In other words, anomalies, anomalous variables shouldn't exist if the weak form of, the, of market efficiency holds. Like we can't, oh, just buy up stocks that did really well in the past and earn a positive abnormal return. That shouldn't be true if the weak form of market efficiency holds. Now, to test whether the semi-strong form of the market efficiency holds, uh, what we could do is take a look at cumulative abnormal returns, or CARs, around the release of new information uh, to the public. Now, we'll talk about this in greater detail, but basically CARs are the investor response around some big event, like an earnings surprise. And if markets are semi-strong form efficient, then the price movement should be instantaneous around that new information being released. Okay, so let's take a look at anomalous returns and see if we can determine whether the market is weak form market efficient. So what are anomalies? An anomaly is a strategy or a return characteristic that consistently outperforms or underperforms what the strategy would have yielded using a model like the cap -M. Now, there is a huge amount of research out there on anomalies. I mean, this goes back all the way to, oh, the 1960s. Uh, basically, if you want to see a list of these, go ahead and click this link. Uh, basic, I mean, there's a huge number of anomalies that have been found in the last several decades. Uh, there's actually a, a recent paper out there, uh, I believe it's by Chen at all, but basically they, they look at something or they start referring to the factor zoo, which indicates this huge number of anomalies that have been discovered. And what they find is that Usually, after these anomalies are discovered, they tend to uh, attenuate. In other words, you know, they may have found the researchers may have found a positive alpha in their research, but once it's announced, that alpha very quickly becomes well statistically insignificant. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these anomalies. I wanted to show you or talk about five anomalies. Uh, we'll start off with the momentum anomaly. Momentum essentially says that stocks continue to outpour, outperform for a significant short-term period. So usually we look at, oh, say, 3 to 12 months. Okay, so let's talk about what we see here. So what we see here is two sets of time periods. 3, 6, 9, and 12 over here on the vertical, and 3, 6, 9, and 12 over here on, uh, in, for our uh, columns. So the J's here, they tell us how long the returns lasted for, or the return period prior to portfolio sorting. So what we're doing here, or what these researchers are doing here, is sorting s different stocks into portfolios based on their returns over the past three months, six months, nine months, or 12 months. So they're sorting them into uh, 10 different deciles, 10 different portfolios, and then looking at the returns of the portfolio that had the highest returns and uh, the portfolio that had the lowest returns of the 10 portfolios. And they're looking at those returns over three months, six months, nine months, or 12 months. So what this very first oval says is that the stocks that underperformed over the past three months prior, prior to portfolio uh, constitution underperformed or had a, a return of 87 basis points. Uh, the next returns in the second oval indicate the average returns of the stocks with the highest returns in the past three months over the next 12 months. And the third oval indicates the difference in the returns between these two portfolios. You know, essentially buy portfolio minus sell portfolio or 10 minus 1. This number 69 basis points, or 69% per month, 
indicates that if you shorted the stocks with the worst performance over the past three months and bought the stocks with the best performance over the last three months, you would have a return of 69 basis points per month. That translates to about 8.4% per year, which is an enormous return. Uh, now, the implication of this paper is that there is a market anomaly. Uh, past winners outperform past losers. If you're an investor, you should buy past winners and short past losers. Now, this paper flies in the face of the efficient markets hypothesis. In essence, it suggests that even the weak form of market efficiency is not true. If weak form of market efficiency was true, this anomaly would disappear as soon as it was discovered. To put this in perspective, I actually collected some additional data. So that original paper, I mean, that, that data ends in, oh, probably the 80s, maybe the early 90s. Uh, I collected this going through about January of this year. And here's what I found. Basically, if you sort all stocks into these 10 momentum deciles, so you know, think of this as the worst performing stocks over the last, oh, in this case, I think it was six months. Uh, up here, we have the best performing stocks over the last six months. What you can see is a definite trend. The, the worst performers have a, a one-year return of about 4%. The best performers over the six months prior to portfolio formation have about an 18% return. So, I mean, even after this anomaly, this momentum anomaly was discovered, I mean, these stocks are still outperforming the losers. The winners are outperforming the losers uh, by an even bigger margin of about, oh, uh, just shy of 14% annually. That's enormous. I, I can't give you uh, an alpha that's bigger than that on a, an anomaly. Now, another anomaly is the long-term reversal anomaly. Uh, so this is actually the uh, uh, one of the earlier anomalies found by Debont and Thaler, 85. Uh, so basically what you do is you sort all stocks into one of a couple of portfolios. So the loser portfolio is the worst performing stock portfolio. The winner portfolio, uh, in this case, I believe it's, uh, oh, just the, the best performing 50% of stocks. So you see how these stocks did over the past three years and put them in one of these two portfolios. And then you look at how they do after portfolio formation. And what you can see here is that the winners actually underperform over the next three years the losers actually outperform over the next three years. So this is what we sometimes call the long-term reversal anomaly. Basically, returns actually reverse if you look far enough in the future. Uh, so this, again, is another anomaly that you know, kind of runs contrary to the efficient markets hypothesis. We shouldn't see this if markets are efficient. Another anomaly you should be familiar with is the value anomaly. So what I did was I took some data on stocks, I, uh, we sort into portfolios based on book to market ratio. So these stocks right here have the lowest book to market ratio. And then the stocks in this portfolio have the highest book to market ratio at portfolio formation. What you can see is that absolutely the value stocks outperform what we sometimes call the growth stocks, these low book to market ratio stocks, pretty significantly. Even if I update the data, you know, the, the anomaly doesn't bear out over the most recent time period as well, but you can still see a definite upward trend here. The value stocks still continue to outperform the growth stocks by, oh, about 5%-ish. All right, now we have the size anomaly. So with the size anomaly, you're sorting all stocks in the market based on market cap, and you're putting them into one of 10 deciles. So these stocks are the smallest stocks in the market. These are the biggest stocks in the market. And what you can see is that the small stocks over the next year after portfolio formation, they absolutely outperform the biggest stocks. Okay, so are markets inefficient? Well, maybe. A lot of anomalies often disappear after they're discovered. I just showed you the ones that have kind of persisted through time. Uh, if you want to see that Factor Zoo paper, they actually walk through how many of those anomalies have disappeared and it's a huge number of anomalies. Essentially, a lot of anomalies, they just don't bear out once people start or become aware of them. So why is that? Why are there so few anomalies like 
the momentum anomaly or the value anomaly that persist? Well, it could have been the case that data mining was used to find these anomalies. Maybe people just, you know, researchers, you know, they were trying to find something that would predict stock returns because their career uh, objectives were based on publishing well, and they found something that was uh, offered a positive alpha, and they published it, and then as soon as it became known and they, people started using different data sets, the anomaly disappeared. Basically, it was an artifact of the data. Another explanation for this is that as soon as investors be became aware of this, you know, this became public knowledge, investors started trading on these anomalies. So if everyone knows that small stocks outperform big stocks or, you know, something like that, everyone's going to start to buy small stocks, boost the price up, and the future returns down. Uh, that can happen. That's what happens, I think, with a lot of these anomalies. Essentially, as soon as people are aware of it, they start trading on the anomaly, and the anomaly disappears. So that's that. Okay, so what else might reduce anomalous returns? Well, uh, usually what we found in our academic research is that stocks with greater analyst coverage, you know, stocks like Apple and Google, where there's 50 analysts covering the stock, those stocks tend to not experience as much of uh, these anomalous returns. Basically, greater information transparency weakens some of these anomaly returns. A lot of these anomalies, they only persist in the portfolio of stocks that really don't get covered by analysts. Uh, also, strong price competition kind of uh, allows the market price of the stock to reflect the fair value or intrinsic value of the stock. If a lot of investors are trading on a stock, it's more likely that the market price is going to reflect the intrinsic value. You know, going along with this, uh, I know I didn't show you the, the research on this in this video, but you, if you want to take my word for it, essentially, a lot of these anomalous returns, they're much stronger in emerging markets where there's a lot less liquidity and there's more information asymmetry. Uh, so in other words, uh, any place where there's fewer investors and there's less information and it's easier to hide information, that's where we tend to see some of these anomalous returns crop up. So, uh, an obvious question, if some anomalies are still significant, you know, even though some other anomalies are not, how do investors trade on that? Well, quite frankly, a lot of investors or investment houses they build portfolios that hold or take long positions on the side of the anomaly that is expected to outperform, say like high momentum stocks, and they short uh, stocks that have low performance. Uh, so you know, the low momentum stocks, for example. So there are a couple of companies out there like AQR or Two Sigma, and these companies, I mean, it's kind of their goal to use quantitative research. So look at some of the past academic research and industry research, see what is offered predictive ability, and then trade on that. So this is AQR's website. I mean, they, they use a variety of strategies and trade on, well, essentially, trades that have been found to offer positive alphas and short the stocks and other assets that have negative alphas. And one obvious point, I guess I should, probably should say it, uh, if an anomaly is truly valuable and I'm an investor, I would never want to reveal that information. I mean, academics have the incentive to publish, so they're trying to find some of these anomalies and they're more likely to let the world know about these anomalies. But a lot of investors, if they find an anomaly, they're not going to reveal information about that anomaly and they're going to keep trading on it. Usually, once these anomalies become uh, widely known, the overwhelming majority of them, you know, they, they just kind of disappear. Okay, so that's anomalies and, you know, how they relate to market efficiency. We do see that most of these anomalies disappear, but there are some anomalies that persist, and that kind of runs contrary to the efficient markets hypothesis. Now, another way that we can determine what level of market efficiency exists is through the use of CARs, or cumulative abnormal returns. Uh, these things represent the actual returns minus the expected returns around some event. And we, we take a look at these using essentially a two-step process. First off, we identify a time and a particular asset. So we want to know, is there an event that's happening, like a quarterly earnings announcement? 
Well, what we might do is look at the investor response or the car around new information being revealed by the company. Uh, the way we do that is we take the actual return on a given day, subtract from that the predicted return on that same day. So, you know, we basically, if you want to take a look down here, I've got some details on it, but we essentially just use something called the market model. Uh, it's really nothing more than the cap M. Uh, we calculate the alpha, the risk-free rate and the beta, uh, estimate the market return, and, you know, whatever that, you know, we plug in the market return and that'll give us our expected return on this stock. Uh, so all we're doing to get our abnormal return on a given day is just taking actual minus expected return using essentially the cap M. And then our car is just the sum of all those abnormal returns. Now what we should see if markets are semi-strong form efficient is that as new information becomes public, these cars should be significant. So a good example is something I might have here where we see like really no cumulative abnormal return until, oh, sometime shortly before an event, let's say an earnings announcement, and then pop, there's some positive information related to the earnings announcement. Maybe the firm had positive EPS or an earnings per share that was greater than analysts expected. So that's positive information. Investors push the price of the stock upward, and immediately we see this, you know, this increase in uh, the share price. Uh, we sometimes see this around merger announcements. So usually the target of a merger, we see their share price rise instantaneously in a few fractions of a second. Uh, but what this tells us is that as new information comes into the market publicly, uh, it's priced in. I mean, these cars where we see these significant cars, this is evidence that markets are semi-strong form market efficient. Now, a final question, are markets strong form efficient? Well, it depends on who you ask and where you look. I mean, the strong form of market efficiency says that not just public but private information is taken into the share price of the stock. And in some countries, that may be more true than the U.S. In the U.S., we have uh, insider trading laws. So, you know, this has led to the, the busts or the, the insider trading uh, cases against, say, like people like Martha Stewart or Raj Rajaratnam. Uh, so in the case of Martha Stewart, she received some information that a stock or a couple stocks that she was holding, uh, they were going to, I believe... Uh, see some negative returns, so she sold them based on that insider information, and she was nabbed by the, the SEC, and she did some prison time for that. Uh, ironically, on their show with uh, Snoop Dogg, only one of them is a convicted felon, which I, I just love. Uh, this other guy, Raj Rajaratnam, uh, he ran a, a hedge fund called Galleon Group, and he was trading on insider information, and he made a lot of money uh, based on information that was known by firm insiders, and uh, he, uh, essentially he, uh, he uh, profited from that information, and uh, I believe he's doing prison uh, time right now. All right, so to summarize, market efficiency is a hotly debated topic today. Uh, we have essentially three forms of market efficiency, and you know, depending on who you ask, some people say, the market is semi-strong form market efficient. Other people will say the market is not efficient. Uh, different securities and different markets can exhibit different levels of market efficiency. If we see that momentum trading offers positive alphas, that's an indication that not even the weak form of market efficiency holds because people can use past return information to predict future return information. If we see significant cars, that's going to support the semi-strong form of the efficient markets hypothesis. So uh, enough, what I'm trying to get at here is that in academia, we assume that markets are generally efficient. But in the real world, that's not always the case. My goal here was to show you that uh, you know, markets are very efficient, but they're not perfectly efficient. And this kind of runs counter to the, the EMH. So with that, I'm going to conclude. And if you have any questions, uh, just feel free to reach out. Thank you.